Hello everyone. Today I'll be discussing chapter 3 from Elizabeth Wells' book, West Side Story, Cultural Perspectives on an American Musical. This chapter is entitled, Music About Music, Bernstein and West Side Story, and it takes its title from a statement Bernstein made about Igor Stravinsky during the Norton Lectures at Harvard. Here's what Bernstein said. He was a facile virtuoso, a clever vaudevillian, a talented ballet composer parading as a symphonist a thieving magpie, and the most unforgivable sin of all, he didn't restrict his thieving. He was an eclectic. He wrote music about other music. Music about music. This very powerful quote creates Wells' main topic of discussion in this chapter, that West Side Story was more of a culmination of prevailing traditions than a work pioneering new trends. More explicitly, she states that the chapter aims to study the work not only from originality or organic standpoints, which it has already been studied in depth by others, including Jack Gottlieb, but rather from a more postmodern view, finding out what lies beneath the surface and examining influences and borrowings. Now before we get into it, I'd like to give a little background information on Elizabeth Wells. She is currently a professor of musicology in Canada, and her research interests are in music history pedagogy, British musical theater, and American musical theater. Her doctoral dissertation at the Eastman School of Music was on West Side Story and eventually expanded into this book. In this chapter, Wells uses mostly sources containing Bernstein's own words to create parallels between West Side Story and works by other composers. These include mainly the Norton Lectures, The Joy of Music, and other interviews and quotes from varying sources. One of the first points Wells emphasizes is the eclecticism of Leonard Bernstein's music and draws from an interview with Paul Laird in 1991. This is something we've already seen, as it was also included in Anthony Bouchard's second chapter from his book on On the Waterfront. Bernstein said that without basing your work on what's come before it, you don't exist. I think that this idea ties very closely with what is discussed in the Norton Lectures, the idea that music and language both come from monogenesis and nature. From here on, Wells uses many of the composers discussed by Bernstein in the Norton Lectures to find borrowings in West Side Story, using the Chomskyan idea of surface structures and deep structures. Wells begins her comparison with the surface structure, discussing Chopin's Mazurka, Op. 17, No. 4. Bernstein uses this piece in the Norton Lectures in, as an example of tonal and rhythmic ambiguity, and these are two important features that characterize West Side Story. She hears a strong resemblance between the ending of the Mazurka and the opening of Maria. They sound almost identical. The ending of the Mazurka is very ambiguous and unresolved, but is continued and completed by Bernstein in Measure 11 of Maria, where the E-flat major chord becomes the dominant of the B major chord. It's also interesting to note that Maria was written before the rest of the musical, and that just a year after West Side Story's premiere, Bernstein used Chopin Mazurkas to exemplify the relationship between music and meaning in an article he published in The Atlantic. Continuing with another composer and longtime friend of Bernstein, David Diamond, Wells sees a motive from his song Somewhere, strikingly similar to Bernstein's version of Somewhere, where it appears at identical pitch. Moving on to the deep structure, Wells discusses the influence of Berlioz's Romeo and Juliet. There are several striking similarities between this work and West Side Story. First and most obvious is the plot lines, as we all know that West Side Story was a modern adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Also, it is interesting to note that Berlioz's piece was one of Bernstein's favorites in the repertoire, and one that he said he felt compelled to promote. Both pieces start with a prologue, depicting the war between rival factions or gangs. Although Berlioz's prologue has text, we mustn't forget that Ber Bernstein's prologue also originally included text, but was eliminated because the performers had difficulty singing it and dancing it at the same time. Bernstein's use of leitmotifs and reminiscence motives are similar to Berlioz's as well. While Berlioz reuses motives from Romeo alone, Bernstein also recalls the motive from Something's Coming, which could be considered Tony alone, and the dance at the gym. This is particularly fascinating because Bernstein spent so much time outlining the theme from Romeo alone in the Norton Lectures. Another similarity is that the most important action in both works is expressed through instrumental music instead of music with text. In West Side Story, the prologue, dance at the gym, rumble, taunting of Anita, and second act ballet are all done without using the standard Broadway song. And the important scenes in Romeo and Juliet are realized by the orchestra alone. There are many more similarities that would require more time for explanation, but they can be found on the following chart. 
All of these can be seen as what Wells calls an extension of an improvement on the great tradition. I find it very interesting that Bernstein championed this great piece by Berlioz as a conductor, and at the same time, it found its way into his own music. Wells then discusses Bernstein's linking of Romeo and Juliet to Wagner's Tristan und Isolde found in the Norton Lectures, outlining Romeo and Juliet as a giant metaphor, or the deep structure of Tristan und Isolde. She takes this notion a step further, pondering whether Tristan is then a model for West Side Story. She says, if Wagner is a transformational magician, is not Bernstein the transformational magician of Wagner? The double tonic complex of A major and C major in Tristan can also be seen in West Side Story in the prologue and in the rumble. Wow. Once again, striking similarities. However, the resolution of the double tonic complex in the Liebestod of Tristan could not be realized in the tritone-stricken tonal structure of West Side Story. And rightly so, this would have negated the purpose of the whole work. There are no resolutions, no answers. Next, Wells discusses transformational grammar, beginning with the music of Bernstein's predecessors, George Gershwin and Igor Stravinsky. Bernstein admired Gershwin greatly, as outlined by Wells in an excerpt from his essay, Why Don't You Go Upstairs and Write a Nice Gershwin Tune. After he first saw Porgy and Bess in college, Bernstein says it changed his life. He knew the score inside and out, and it shows in his own music. Wells believed that Porgy formed a deep structure to West Side Story. The African-American and white worlds in Porgy parallel the adult and teenage worlds in West Side Story exemplified by Wells in a scene from each where the African-American or teenage world interacts with the white or adult world. In both scenes, the imposition by the police and defiance by teens is found. Additionally, West Side Story was originally supposed to be a three-act work like Porgy, and Gershwin's song, I Got Plenty of Nothing" is in similar style form and sentiment to Bernstein's, I Feel Pretty. Concerning Stravinsky, as the tritone became the heart of Petrushka, it also became the heart of West Side Story. Rhythm was also a similar playing field for both composers. Bernstein's shifting rhythmic accents at the beginning of the rumble are similar to the rhythmic displacement in the Augurs of Spring section of the Rite of Spring, which Bernstein described in detail in his final Norton lecture. More so than music, though, are Bernstein and Stravinsky similar. In the last Norton lecture, Bernstein described Stravinsky as the angel of deliverance who arrived just in time to save tonality before World War I. Wells asks, was this not, in essence, also part of Bernstein's overall agenda as a composer? He does explicitly state in the, his last lecture that he believes in musical poetry that is tonal by nature. Was Bernstein, like Stravinsky, trying to prove that tonality will last forever? In conclusion, Wells believes that out of all the examples presented, the surface structure of David Diamond and the deep structure of George Gershwin are the most important in Bernstein's borrowings. However, neither of them were mentioned in the Norton Lectures. She also suggests that the setting of the Norton Lectures reflects Bernstein's dichotomy between composer and conductor, which was a lifelong struggle for him. Did he create these lectures to place himself within the historical continuum he described? If you look at it from Wells' point of view, West Side Story becomes subtly told to the audience through his presentation of repertoire. So then, is Bernstein an original, an organic, a modernist, or is he a musical plagiarist? It's clear that he was torn, desiring to be a great art music composer and to be the next Gershwin. West Side Story was his greatest musical, but Wells thinks it was also his great American opera, and because of his inner struggle, he failed to recognize that. Now that we've gone through the chapter, here's a few thoughts that I have. I feel like Wells poses a lot of questions about Bernstein to the reader, especially towards the end of the chapter. No doubt, these are great questions that spawn deep thought and discussion, but she usually doesn't answer them. Maybe she doesn't want to in order to create discussions in a seminar like ours, or maybe she does it so that she'll remain neutral or unbiased, but I'd wish that she had answered them because I wanted to know what she thought. Also, I think that this article could have been organized a little better on her part. Although she places Gershwin in the transformational grammar portion of the chapter with Stravinsky, I think he would fit better in the deep structure section with Berlioz and Wagner. She even refers to the deeper structure of Gershwin towards the end of the chapter. The similarity in underlying themes between Porgy and Bess and West Side Story, specifically the relationships and struggles between ages and races, led me to believe that this information should be included in the deep structure section instead of in the transformational grammar section. 
In her conclusion, Wells states that Diamond and Gershwin played the largest role in Bernstein's borrowings for West Side Story. Why is this? It seemed to me like more emphasis was placed on Berlioz and Romeo and Juliet than on Gershwin. And why the Diamond? That piece received the shortest attention out of all the ones in the chapter. Did she pick these two because they were the only ones not mentioned in the Nord Lectures? Lastly, she includes another quote by Stephen Sondheim about purpleness in Bernstein's writing. What does that even mean? I'm still really confused about the purpleness thing. These are just a few critical points that I found, but overall, I thought that the chapter was very interesting, and I appreciate Wells for taking on a new perspective of analyzing West Side Story. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in class.